Isn't that funny? We tried to perform then. Yeah, and it went really bad. I didn't like it. <laughs> you can't really claim that a song is completely original in and of itself. Like everything's built on the shoulders of everything else. Like your your entire life's experience and every song you've ever listened to goes into the creative process. You don't really own your own song. Like you wrote it, but really a thousand people wrote that song. That's just true. <laughs> Music, spirituality, and the human experience. Meandering tales of makers, risk takers, movers, and shakers. Welcome to the Long for the Coast podcast. Hey, welcome back to the Long for the Coast podcast. Uh, this is episode two. It's called A Thousand People Wrote That Song. It's a short episode. Where we start off talking about our song Hold On Brother, and it's actually quite personal video share a couple of stories that Sophie hasn't like shared with that many people yet and how proud of her I am she is one of the bravest people I know a few things coming up we've got two gigs one at cabin cafe which is on Saturday the 23rd of November and then we're playing in Totnes at st. John's Church with a 70 piece chamber choir which is really exciting doing a bit of collaborating with them so yeah Hope you can make it to those. Also, uh, me and Kirsty Cow, who's the guest in this episode, we're gonna be running online group therapy sessions uh, around the topic of Where's My Tribe? A group for those in search of meaningful connection. And that starts on the 12th of November, 7.30 till 9.30, it's a two hour session. And uh, there's an Eventbrite link for that in the description below if you're interested. So yeah. I hope you enjoy the episode. What's that, Rose? You want to be a drummer? Of course you want to be a drummer. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming back. I love having these chats with you. And I'm really thankful that you're up for doing another one. So I thought it would be cool to chat about uh, Holden Brother today. Yeah. Tell me what it means to you. Tell me when you wrote it and what was happening at the time. I had a call from a friend who said, I'm writing my will. I'm potentially really unwell. I don't know how the next period of time is going to go. So I just want you to know, like, your friendship means something to me. And I'm like, will you pray for me? And, you know, it was, it was one of those conversations that, that meant that I ended up writing that song. So yeah, it, mean, it means a lot to me on a personal level. And I'm really thankful that that it means something to him as well. The way you described the second half about being about you and your relationship, did you fear losing something in your relationship? We recorded that song really soon after we found out that Sophie needed to have emergency brain surgery. And you know, Sophie was really struggling with walking and her vision and all sorts at that at that point, and it was the last song to record on the album. And I was in Bristol and Sophie was in Devon and she said, I need to finish that song so that we finish the album because like we're full of faith that things are going to be okay, but, but we don't know how the next few weeks is going to go. And so, yeah, she wasn't feeling good at all, but she, she got on a bus <laughs> and she came up to Bristol to our friend Stian's house. Shout out to Stian Verdoy, Firewood Island, great band. And she got her vocals down for that song. And I just felt so proud of her. Mm. So it was a, the whole process around recording that song was a really big deal for us. Right. Sounds and, like it meant a lot to both of you, like lots of threats to l losing relationships. Yeah, yeah. That was a big time for us. Like recording that album, it took... It took a long time, uh, but particularly that last weekend was pretty emotive. <laughs> Something I love about music is that you can't really claim that a song is completely original in and of itself. Like everything's built on the shoulders of everything else. Like your, your entire life's experience and every song you've ever listened to goes into the creative process. Like. Bob Dylan was massively influenced by Woody Guthrie. It's like, dress like him, play like him, 
you know, like modeled his early self on, on Woody Guthrie. And then Tom Waits was massively influenced by Bob Dylan when he started out playing uh, acoustic songs uh, in a club that he was working at, working on the door. And then he'd get up and play Bob Dylan covers. And then into other genres, like the Gaslight Anthem, New Jersey punk rock band, massively influenced by Tom Waits. And when you know that, you, you hear so many references or like vocal inflections really clearly through that lineage. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something really uh, humble about that that I really like about music. It's you don't really own your own song. Like you wrote it, but really a thousand people wrote that song. That's just true. <laughs> Who inspired you? Um, Who would we hear if we listen to the lineage of your song? Will Rene. He's one of my best friends. There's a band called Against Me, who had, have always been one of my favourite bands. And I, I started playing the guitar because I wanted to learn the song uh, Baby I'm an Anarchist, because I wanted to be able to play something at a house party, and I, I loved that song. Um, Frank Turner was a, a big influence, uh, Billy Bragg, the Gaslight Anthem. The question I love asking people is Tom Waits or Bob Dylan? I think you can, you can learn a lot about someone through that question. Boots of Spanish Leather is probably, probably the best song ever written. And there's no chorus. It's like a perfect love song between two people on either side of an ocean as a series of letters. It's perfect. But yeah, I still much prefer Tom Waits. I want to ask you a load of questions about relationships. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you've, you've been, um, you've been a gold mine of inspiration to me for a very long time in all that you've shared with me as a tutor, as a supervisor. In your experience, what are the things that couples most often bring to a counseling session like if there are whether it's couples counseling or individually like what would you say would be like the top the top three things that come up the most well i'd say it's all encompassed within relationships their relationship to themselves and their relationship to other people their relationship to what they perceive success to be, uh, their place in the world. Mm. I would say I would say they're the top three. And their place in the world. Yeah. Was the last one. Yeah, which I think leads to to what the perception is about success or what what we should do. I guess purpose existential mm. purpose, uh, the purpose of living, the purpose of our lives, and the the milestones or the goals in which we're taught that we're supposed to meet something that's helping me with that is remembering that good enough really is good enough things don't have to be perfect because that isn't human like that's just an idea that someone had it's not real and it's quite a dangerous idea because you just tie yourself in knots your whole life if your metric for success is perfect versus not good enough. But if you can accept yourself, which is quite a challenge, I think you can only really progress in a healthy way with something after you've accepted, after you've accepted who you are and where you're at. I think I've been really self-critical for a long time and the fear of judgment definitely fuels that. The way I try and explain it sometimes is if it feels uncomfortable being you and you're here, it's a bit like walking on hot coals. But if you come over here and you're critical of that, that feels like a more empowered position to be in. But it doesn't move you anywhere. You're actually staying on hot coals. But the more that we can find spaces to sit in our grief with people, that's mourning, right? The difference between grief and mourning. Grief's kind of an inside job, but mourning is to feel witnessed in our grief, and it's mourning that begins to heal the body. Suddenly, the coals start to dissipate, and our, our back to zero point feels more peaceful. 
Do you agree with that? Yeah, I've never really thought about it from that perspective. I guess like like you're adding another fight by criticizing yourself. Like you're adding you against you. Yeah. Nightmare, isn't it? <laughs> like that stalemate. Yeah. Which is it's the no movement. Yeah, and you'd think if you're gonna be someone's friend in the world, like start with yourself, surely. <laughs> like the things that we that we say to ourselves in our heads, most of the time we'd never talk like that to other people. Mm-hmm. I don't like, want to generalize for everyone, but <laughs> Yeah, like and I I guess it's what we learned by witnessing it from other people growing up. It comes that tape recorder that we learn this is how we respond to mistakes or how we respond to not doing what what people expected of us. Mm. And now we write the expectations for ourselves. Mm. And they're still often just as unreasonable. What I would take away that's relevant for me today is like one, the importance of connection. And two, like a bit like what you were talking about, how like trying to get it right, trying to get it perfect just gets in the way of authentic you know, communication and connection with others. Mm. Yeah, like imagine what all of us would achieve in this life if we didn't have so much fear of judgment Mm -hmm. and if we could speak with really clear channels with people all the time. Like we need a measure of fear because it stops us doing stupid things. Like it's on our side, but if it's out of whack, then it's a limitation. Thanks so much for being up for another chat today. Cheers, mate. Bye. Take care.